Let us pray, please. Father, we come this morning thanking you and praising you. We ask, Father, that you anoint us and use us this morning, Father, to bring your word, giving you, Father, the honor and the glory for all this accomplished. And we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I uh, told some of you some time back that I was going to um, teach on this. I, I had been preparing for it for quite some time. So I thought as I was praying the, uh, about two weeks ago about what to do, and this was the message that was given me. So I want to talk about the Nephilim. A lot of people have heard the, about the Nephilim and a lot of people haven't. Uh, a lot of people through religion uh, have heard explanations or no explanation about the Nephilim. Uh, but the truth is in history, it's in the scripture, it's there. It exists in the Bible. Uh, and we're going to go to the Bible to look and we're going to search out the truth um, of the Nephilim in the, in the scripture this morning. And we're going to look at the historical account that's in the scriptures as, as it is recorded there. We're going to look at several places in the Bible. Uh, you have the scripture there with you. Uh, you can, of course, turn with me in your Bible. Uh, we're going to start in 1 Peter, so if you want to go ahead and turn there, 1 Peter chapter 3. But um, too many times our churches want to teach the story but never reveal the fact of the story. And I can think back when I was young, a young Christian in church and think about to the story of David and Goliath. That's the favorite story of the church, the religious church to teach. But they never really talk about Goliath. They really never tell you where Goliath came from, who he was, why he was a giant. The whole purpose of the story was that David slew the giant. But they never really tell you much about the giant. So today, the Nephilim, which are the giants, we're going to look at, and we're going to talk about those. Uh, it's important that we understand before we get started that Satan, the devil, rebelled against God long before he ever showed up in the garden. So we've talked about that here before. We've talked about in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, of a rebellion, if you will, of Satan against God, against the creation. Uh, just kind of keep that in mind as we get into this. So look with me to 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to look at verse 19. And this is a scripture that I just want you to, again, just kind of take in, and then we'll go from here. Uh, in 1 Peter chapter 3, 19, it says, By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Of course, we're talking about on the resurrection, when Jesus descended into the lower parts of the earth, and he went and he preached unto the spirits that were in prison. Uh, a lot of People know, we've talked about it a lot here, about who these spirits were. It does not refer to the devil's fall. It does not talk about that. This is, we read in Ezekiel and Isaiah, that's the devil's fall of when he was actually thrown out of heaven. But to another rebellion of angels that occurred in the days of Noah. And that's what we want to focus in on today. Uh, before the flood. So we're going to go to Genesis chapter 6 and we're going to pick this story up and we're going to uh, look at this. Now I'm going to read a good bit of scripture today because it's important that you hear the scripture. Uh, and I'm going to read some of the probably a lot of people the most boring scripture in the world because it is all the Begites. And a lot of people don't like to read the Begites but if you don't read the Begites you'll never understand where some of this comes from and how it got there. So just 
just understand that. Look at Genesis chapter 6, and starting with verse 1, we're going to read through verse 8. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, and they were fair. And they took them wives of which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be numbered <clears throat> a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and, after, uh, and also after that. When the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, and the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. The, and God saw that the wickedness of men was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and creeping things, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now there's a lot of information in those few verses there. Um, there was something that happened when man started to multiply. The sons of God saw the daughters of men and took wives from them. Who were the sons of God? Uh, believers in the New Testament have been given authority to believing the, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and his resurrection from the dead to become sons of God. This is before that, so don't get confused. This is before the resurrection, so the sons of God have not been paid for yet when you, come, when you start reading this, this scripture because Jesus has not been sacrificed, Christ has not risen. This was not something that was available to the Old Testament when we start looking at the sons of God. The term sons of God is used three more times in the Old Testament in addition to Genesis chapter 6. In all cases, it denotes angelic beings. And it's all, in all cases, it comes in the book of Job. It's Job chapter 1 verse 6, Job chapter 2 verse 1, and Job 38 verse 7. In short, the beings in Genesis 6 are not human beings. In Genesis 6, 4, we see the results of these unions of human and angelic beings as being giants, the Nephilim. Noah was present at those days. There were the days of Noah. Uh, look, if you will, to 2 Peter chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 4 and 5. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but uh, cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eight persons, a preacher of righteousness, uh, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. This is very telling scripture here when you start looking at this. If God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down into hell and delivered them into chains of darkness. I started off talking about uh, when Christ ascended and he preached to those spirits. These are the spirits that he preached to, these that were held in chains and darkness. These are not the fallen angels that fell with Satan. These are the ones who left their first estate. And when you read verse 5, and spared not the old world, the old world which was the world that existed in the days of Noah. Uh, remember, Noah was a very old person when the flood actually took place. Noah had lived a long time. The world that existed when Noah was on the earth had existed for a long time during Noah's time. So in the days of Noah covers a long period of time. Uh, Jude also speaks about this when you look at Jude in uh, verses 6 and 7. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved an everlasting change under darkness unto the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for, for an example, suffering the vengeance 
of the eternal fire. If you read those verses and you understand what's taking place here, in the days of Noah, when all these things were, were happening, what we see is that this going after the strange flesh of these angels created a situation that God was not happy with at all. It created a situation where there were strange beings, strange creatures that were being born as, as a result of this union between these angels and, and the uh, human beings. This is the same rebellion when we read this in Jude. This is the same rebellion in Genesis 6 and, and 2 Peter 2 where we know sometimes during the time of Noah, angels left their own habitation and went after strange flesh, human. And the daughters of men... Uh, the results, they are reserved and changed under darkness. Now, they haven't been released. They're still there. They're still being held, and they're being held for the great day or the great judgment or the great white throne judgment of God, which will be the final judgment. So just know that these are the, uh, the not the fallen angels that fell with Satan when he was thrown out of heaven. We've talked about that before. We've talked about that there are principalities and powers in the air. Those principalities and powers are the angels that fell with Satan when he was thrown out of heaven. Um, let's kind of break down the Genesis chapter 6 scripture and look at it just a little bit. In verse 4 in Genesis chapter 6, you can kind of back up and look at that on your, on your uh, information there. It says there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bare the, uh, children to them and the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. The only way I know of getting the truth is to work through the scriptures and to understand what is being said and let scripture explain itself. If we try to do anything else, we, we always get into trouble. So Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, what is it actually saying? Well, first it says, in those days, this refers to the days of Noah. And when men began to multiply on the earth. And second, it says also that after that, after what? After the days of Noah. After the days of Noah would be after the flood. In other words, this didn't happen this one time. It was an ongoing event. This spirit of the Nephilim still exists today. Third, the sons of God. Who or what is that? What is it talking about? Is the thing that we want to look at. The answer to these points we have identified uh, will be very in-depth in studying each one of those to the point where we have covered exhaustively the scriptures to cover each one of those points. But we're going to cover it briefly this morning, and then you can go and, and in your time and you can study it out more fully. The angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation... He hath reserved an everlasting change under darkness until the judgment of the great day. As we said a while ago, those are the spirits that, that Jesus actually, Christ actually went and preached to when he descended into hell. So understand they're still there. They're still in change, still in darkness. Let's look now to the family, to Noah and his family. And we're going to look at that family for a moment and try to see what's going on there. Look at Genesis chapter 6, and we're going to start in verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great uh, in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So what was the condition of man? Wicked. It was wicked. In verse 6, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping things and the fowl of the air, for it repented me that I have made them. Now God is repenting of his creation of mankind. 
in verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, Noah has found grace in the midst of all of this. Noah and his family has found grace. And the grace that is found is through Noah. Just understand that. And there's a reason for that. Where did the wickedness of mankind come from? What was the source of the wickedness? So if we look in Genesis chapter 5 and we start in verse 1. Now, this is some of the begites that I was talking about. And I want you to just kind of hang on because it's important that we read through some of this. In the book of the generations of Adam, and that's where we're going to start. In the day that God created man in the likeness of God, made he uh, him them. Understand that God created Adam, created man in his image, which was spirit. When God created Adam in his image, that means that God created Adam perfect. Adam was a perfect creation from God. Look at verse 2. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. Understand also that when he created the male and female spirit, he called both male and female spirits Adam. In verse 3, And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness. In whose likeness? His likeness. <clears throat> after uh, his image and called his name Seth. Now, this scripture, we kind of went forward a little bit here because there were two other sons that, if you remember, Cain and Abel. Let's go forward in verse 5. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. So Adam lived 930 years. And Seth lived 105 years and begot Enos. And Seth lived after he begot Enos 807 years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. So Seth lived uh, 912 years. And Enos lived 90 years and begot Canaan. And Enos left after he begot Canaan 815 years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Enos were 900 years 905 years, and he died. And Canaan lived uh, 70 years and begot Maheli. And Canaan lived after he begot Maheli 800 year, 840 years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Canaan were 910 years, and he died. And Maheli uh, lived 60 and 5 years and begot Jared. And Mahali lived after he begot Jared 800 year, 830 years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Mahali were uh, 890 and five years, and he died. And Jared lived 160 and two years, and he begot Enoch. And Jared lived after he begot Enoch 800 years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Jared were 960 and two years, and he died. And Enoch lived 605 years and begot Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begot Methuselah 300 years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. So what happened to Enoch? God took him. An important point, just to remember that God took Enoch. And Methuselah lived 180 and seven years and begot uh, Lamech. And Methuselah lived after he begot Lamech 780 and two years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Methuselah were 960 and nine years and he died. And, and Lamech lived 180 and two years and begot a son. And he called his name Noah saying this uh, same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. And Lamech lived after he begot Noah 595 years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Lamech were 770 and seven years, and he died. And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. We come down to Noah. There was 10 generations from Adam to Noah. And Noah being the tenth 
of these generations. But remember, the age of these people were great. So the generation in this group of people was not the same as the generation in our time today. The generation, if you notice the age of these people at, at the age that they died, they were very old people. Methuselah was the oldest person that's recorded in the Bible. Most of these people leave six, seven, eight hundred years that they were living at the particular time. A lot of people say, well, why? Why do these people live so long back then? They were ten generations from the creation of God with Noah. So all of, these cre all of these generations that were between Adam and Noah, they were, as far as their gene pool, if you want to get kind of technical about it, was very pure from the original creation that God made when he created Adam. So as those generations come forward, our generations now degrade more and more and more as we go along with our gene pool. So you saw in there 120 years is what God actually allotted. A lot of that has to do with the fact that we are degrading. So we don't live that long. We, how many people do you know today live 120 years? Not many. There's not very many people at all that live to be that age. Today, our average age is 80-something years old, and that's actually increased because of medical technology over the last couple of decades. But just know that what's going on here and see what's taking place and understand that these people, when they were having children for hundreds of years, they were having, you notice it said, and they had other sons and daughters, there were a lot of people being placed on the earth as these people were moving through these generations. So just know, Adam had 130 years from creation to the birth of Seth. You have to go back and add up the numbers that God gives us in the scripture to figure out exactly what's going on. Adam had 130 years from the time that God actually created him until Seth was born. And during that time, Adam fell in the garden he had one son to murder the other. So we asked the question, where did all of the wickedness come from? Satan was already in the earth when Adam was created. It's important that we understand that, that we understand that that wicked spirit, that evil spirit was already here. And as we teach here at this church in Genesis chapter 1, verses is one and two, we see that evil spirit actually influence the earth. And that's way before the creation of, of Adam. That's way before God creates his perfect creation, which is mankind. As we have pointed that out time and time again in Genesis chapter one, verses one and two, you can see the results of Satan being cast out of heaven. Uh, no, now, where we are, again, we can see the results of Satan being on the earth and the wickedness that abounds. And it abounds in these generations that lead up to Noah. You've got to understand that Satan has always tried to copy what God was doing in everything. Uh, when we read in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The Spirit of Satan was moving upon the face of the water also. You have to remember the reason that there's darkness, the reason there was chaos. If you read that and you understand there was chaos, God did not, does not create chaos. So what we're seeing there is we're seeing Satan in competition with God trying to create chaos in the perfect creation that God was, uh, was involved in. So just understand that Satan has his spirit moving also. And as soon as God made man uh, in God's image, Satan sent his spirit to destroy that creation of God. And he attacked the weakest link, which was Eve. And that's not to say women are weaker than men. That's just to say that the weakest link of the creation was Eve because Adam was created in the image of God. Eve was created from Adam. So she was one step weaker or less than the creation of Adam. Doesn't make her any less of a whatever. It just makes her creation one step down from what Adam was. 
So when we see that, we understand why Satan went to Eve and not Adam. He went to the weakest link. When we look at and we start looking at this and we start thinking about the house of Noah, uh, all of Satan's work between the creation of Adam and all the way up to Noah, Satan is corrupting all of mankind up to this point. He does that through what we read about the, the sons of God coming into the daughters of men and the giants being born, the Nephilim being born. Those evil spirits consume the world, if you will. And all but the house of Noah are affected by the Nephilim. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That grace was found because he, his generation, was, his family was still pure. And this brings us to the sons of God. Who were the sons of God? The rabbinical Jewish interpretation of the sons of God is rulers or princes. So given that we have already established the sons of God here is a reference to demonic possessed rulers. Remember, Satan has established his spirit on the earth. Also, if man chooses to pursue that spirit rather than the spirit of God, then Satan has control of the whole package. And that's exactly what's taking place. We talked earlier in Bible study this morning about the spirit of the Antichrist. The spirit of the Antichrist in our time is the same thing. It is Satan's attempt to take the focus off the spirit of God and to put the focus on him. And as the spirit of the Antichrist works in our world today, the same spirit was actually working, and it was Satan, in the days of Noah. So the days of Noah leading up to the flood were the, was the time that Satan was actually working, he was working through, and one of the things he used was the Nephilim to do that. Uh, <clears throat> how did the Nephilim get back if you will, into the uh, line of man after the flood. That's always the question that everybody wants to ask. Didn't the flood clear everything away? Didn't it make everything right? Didn't it make everything, put everything back? Well, Satan is still here. He, still, he was still up, fluttering over the face of the water regardless of what was taking place. He's still here. So his spirit is still here, and that spirit, that same spirit is still part of that spirit and is part of that antichrist spirit that we see today. So there's some amazing facts that I want to give you this morning as we look at this. Remember in Genesis chapter 6 verse 4, you can flip back on that, there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bare children to them and the same became mighty men uh, uh, which were of old, of renown. After the uh, flood of Noah's sons began to have offspring. Look at, flip over to Genesis chapter 9 and let's look at verse 19. I want to kind of give you some more information. Some more of those begot uh, some of the boring reading sometimes, but a lot of information is contained in here and I want you to really get a hold of this. And it also tracks that evil spirit even in Noah's family as it comes forward. So look at what's actually taking place. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 18, And the sons of Noah that went forth uh, of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Ham is the father of Canaan. Now, any time the Bible raises a flag, which it just raised a flag, it told us that Shem, Ham, and Japheth all left the ark. But then it identified Ham as the father of Canaan. That's an important point. That's a point you want to take note of and you want to look for a further explanation of it and we'll get it. Anytime that scripture adds information that uh, should be a flag for us to investigate. So why did God add a statement in 918 that Ham is the father of Canaan? Look at Genesis 9 and we're going to start in verse 19. These are the three sons of Noah, in verse 19. And of them was the whole earth overspread. So what did the sons of Noah do? They repopulated the earth. They replenished the earth. 
in verse 20. And Noah began to be a husband, and he planted a vineyard. So Noah began to plant grapevines. He began to grow grapes, and he began a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered in his tent. This story a lot of people know, but pay attention to what takes place here. Noah planted a vineyard. He made wine. He drank the wine. He became drunk, and he became uncovered in his tent. Now, there's a whole lot that we could go into about being uncovered, but being uncovered is having sin exposed. Okay? Being uncovered is a whole lot more than just being naked. Being naked is a whole lot more than just not having clothes on. Being naked means that you are exposed. All of your sin is exposed. All the evil is exposed. <clears throat> Look at verse 22. And Ham, the father of Canaan, just please note, the identifier of Ham is the father of Canaan, always. Saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. He saw his father, he saw the nakedness of his father, and he went and told his two brothers. Look at what his brothers do. And Sham and Japheth took a garment, laid it upon both their shoulders, and went backwards and covered the nakedness of their father, and their faces were backwards, and they saw not their father's nakedness. His two brothers decided that they didn't need to see, they were supposed to see the nakedness of their father. So they covered the nakedness of their father without looking at it. In verse 24, And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Curse be Canaan. He didn't say curse be Ham. He said curse be Canaan. A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth and shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years. Now, Genesis 10 starts off with a statement about the generations of the sons of Noah, so we need to look at that to get an indication of what's going on after the flood. This is after the flood. In Genesis chapter 10 and verse 2, Japheth, the father of all the Gentiles, and the son of Japheth, sons of Japheth are Gomer, Magog, uh, uh, Madal, and Javan, Tubal, and Mershes, and Tyrus. The sons of Gomer, Askenaz, Rapha, and Tomagath. And the sons of Javan, Elisha, and Tarshish, uh, Kittim, and Dotham. And these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in the lands from everyone his tongue after their families in their nations. So all the Gentile nations came from Japheth as he began to overspread the earth. The next we look at Shem. <clears throat> Shem, the father of all the Jewish people. In verses 22 in chapter 10, the children of Shem, Elam, Asher, Af Afrex, Lud, and Aaron, and the children of Aaron, Uz, Hul, uh, Gather, and Mash, and Aphrax begot Shela, and, and Shelah begot uh, Ebert. And unto Ebert were born two sons. The sons of one was uh, Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided, and his brother's name was Jotkin. And Jotkin begat uh, Almadiad, and Shephel, and Hazar, Meth, and Jared, and, and in verse 27. And Jadaram and Uzael and Dikon and Odel and uh, Abilam and Sheba and Over Orup and Havilah and uh, Joab, and all these were sons of Jodkin, and their dwelling was from uh, Mesha, as thou goest uh, unto Sephar, a mount uh, of the west. And these are the sons of Shem, after their families, after their tongues, in their land after their nations. And all these nations were the nations that eventually wound up being uh, the Jews. Now, Ham is the one we want to focus on here because remember, Ham is the one that Noah 
uh, actually pronounced a curse on. Ham, the father of all the ites. If you study in the Old Testament and you look for the evil in the Old Testament, you're always going to find a nation or a group of people uh, who are part of the ites that are attached to it. And the ites, along with the Philistines, are always going to be there. So look at Genesis chapter 10 and look at verse 6. And the sons of Ham, Cush and Mizraim and uh, Put and Canaan. And the sons of Cush, Sheba and Havilah and Sabbath and Ramah and Sabbathish. And the sons of Ramah, Sheba and Dedan in Genesis chapter 10 verse 8. And Cush begot Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. Remember the identification of what a mighty one is? That is a Nephilim, that is a giant. That spirit is back on the earth again as it is identified there. As Cush begot Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. Now, <clears throat> the Bible doesn't tell us that Nimrod was a giant, but it does tell us that he was a mighty one, a mighty warrior on the earth, and which is one of the ways that the giants, the Nephilim, were identified. So look at verse 9. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Baal, Erech, and Akkad, and uh, Kalneth, and the land of Sh uh, Shinar. And out of that land went forth uh, Asher and builded Nineveh, the city of Reboth and Kala, and resin between Nineveh and Kala, and the same is the great city. And Mesim begat Ludum and uh, Anam and Leobam and Napathium and Pat. These names are terrible. Out of whom came Phyllis and the Cap uh, Capistorum. And Canaan begot Sidon, his firstborn, and Heath, and the Jebusites, and the Armorites, and the Gergesites, and the Hevites, and the Archites, and the Sinites, and the Artavites, and, and Zimranites, and the Hamanites, and afterwards were the families of the Canaanites spread abroad. And the borders of the Canaanites were from Sidon, uh, thou comest to Gir, unto Gir, and thou goest up uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and Adam and Zemor, even unto Lasha. These are the sons of Ham after their families, after their tongues, in the countries, and in their nations. It's interesting when you start looking at this and you start understanding that the curse that Noah pronounced on his son Ham is the curse that goes forward. And everything that is a problem to Israel after this comes out of that curse. All of these ites are the ones that they had to fight when they were going into the promised land. Everything, every step that Israel takes, they're having to fight these people, this curse. Um, <clears throat> now, I want to look just for a minute at Genesis chapter 11 and look at verse 10. We want to start there because it's important that we understand uh, where this line actually goes and how it goes, where it goes to. When we look at the generations of Shem, Shem was 100 years old in verse 10. It says, these are the generations of Shem. Shem was 100 years old when, uh, and begot uh, Aphrax two years after the flood. And Shem lived after uh, begotting Aphrax 500 years and begot sons and daughters. And it goes through the whole list of all of his sons and daughters. Comes down to verse 19, it says, And Peglug lived after he begot Ru 209 years and begot sons and daughters. And Ru lived 230 years and begot Shrug. And Ru lived after he begot Shrug 207 years and begot sons and daughters. And Shrug lived uh, 30 years and begot Naor. And Shrug lived after he begot Naor 200 years and begot sons and daughters. And Naor lived 920 years and begot uh, Terah. And Naor lived after he begot Terah 119 years and begot sons and daughters. And then in chapter 11, verse 26, And Terah lived 70 years and begot Abram, Naor, and Haran. 
Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Aram, Nerah, and Haran, and Haran begat Lot, and Haran died before his father Terah in the land of the, his nativity of Ur in the Chaldees, and Aram, Abram, and Nerah took them wives. The name of Aram's wife was Sarai, and their na the names of Nerah's wife was uh, Mili, and the daughter of Haran, the father of uh, Melchi, the father of uh, is Iscal. Now, this is the, gets us down to Abram. Gets us down to where the history of Israel actually starts. What I've tried to do is give you the information that shows you how the curse came through the flood and actually was spoken by Noah over his youngest son because of what his youngest son had done. His youngest son had exposed his nakedness, has exposed his sin to his tried to expose it to his two other brothers who covered their father's sin, which is a shadowing type of what God actually did in the garden when uh, Adam and Eve actually fell. God covered their nakedness with the blood-soaked uh, skin of the, of the sacrificed lamb. Just know that this curse comes through. It comes through through the curse that Noah pronounces on his youngest son as it comes in. So the spirit of the Nephilim came through the flood and was still there afterwards because as we go and we study and we look in the Old Testament as they began to go, as Israel began to go into the promised land, what was one of the first issues they ran into when they tried to go into the promised land that God was leading them to? They ran into the giants. <clears throat> Remember the 10 spies they sent into the, to cross the river into the promised land? They go in, they come back and say, there's giants. We, we can't deal with them. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. And Joshua and Caleb were the only ones that said, hey, we can do this. We can take this. We can do it because God is with us. We're not worried about the giants. And they went in. But when you read and you study the scripture in this particular part where Israel is going into the promised land, you'll find out that a lot, of the comp a lot of the enemy that they were facing as they were going into the promised land were the giants. And a lot of them were in the lands of the Ites. A lot of them were the Philistines. And as they were going into this, now, today we don't see the giants that much, or do we? Is the question. Remember, they were only 10 generations away from the original creation when Noah actually spoke the curse on his youngest son. Now we're not, when they go into the land of promise, when they go into the land that God had promised Israel, they were still not that many generations away from the original creation. So what's going on there is still degrading. Even the gene of the giants is degrading. So there is that spirit still out here. And that spirit is creating a lot of problems in the earth today. Today we have more issues with the Antichrist than we do with, and remember, Satan is always keen to compete with everything that God is doing. So I just wanted you to have the information. This, this is just kind of brushing the surface, but you can go back and you can study this. You can look at this. I'm trying to give you enough information that you can go study this for your own. And when you do, then you can see the impact of the Nephilim on everything that was going on. Now, there's all sorts of stories out there. There's all sorts of people that want to tell you that, you know, the Nephilim helped Noah build the ark and all this kind of stuff. Uh, movies been made about that. So if it come out of Hollywood, I'm tr I wouldn't trust it that much. But just know that it is fact. It's in the Bible. It's scriptural that the Nephilim did exist. There were giants. Now, a lot of people want to try to play it off as, as they're just talking about spiritual giants. No, they're not spiritual giants. The, the person that David slew when he killed Goliath was not a spiritual, just a spiritual thing. It was a physical. And he had a brother. We know that his entire family were giants because it tells us that. So just know that giants were real. The Nephilim were real. That spirit is real. That spirit, I think, is transferring into the spirit of the Antichrist that we're dealing with today. It is just Satan's way of trying to destroy the creation that God has made. 
So any time that God has created and everything that God creates is perfect. The only reason it's not perfect when we see it today is because Satan has tried his best to destroy it. And the only way he can destroy it is to introduce his spirit into it. And that's what he was doing with the Nephilim. That's what he's doing with the spirit of the Antichrist. So as we look at this, we, we start to get a, an understanding of this. Just know why these things are put into scripture and why we're... And uh, also understand, a lot of people say, well, they don't explain it in the Old Testament. Things that were common, they didn't tend to explain. You were supposed to know it. So if they mention things in the Old Testament, and especially if it's mentioned several times as a common fact, it just means that everyone knew what they were talking about. They didn't see the need to go into long explanation about things. So don't get upset because there's not a, a, a dictionary explanation of everything that we, we run across in Scripture. Just know that those things were common and those things, and I believe this, the, the Nephilim were a common thing in the days of Noah, and everyone knew what they were. So they were mentioned, <clears throat> but they were never actually detailed or described out. So, could I get everyone to stand, please? Uh, <clears throat> know that the truth of the word is something that's important that we, we need to really grab a hold of today and really think about we teach a lot of, of things here and it's important that you know the depth of the word and what it actually means it's also important to know that the reason the depth of the word is there is to bring us to awareness of Jesus Christ most of this stuff when we go back and we really look at it we see a shadow and type of Jesus Christ. We see even in the story of Noah and his sons covering his nakedness. This, this is a shadowing type of Jesus Christ. So today when we think of where we are and how we uh, fit into all of this, where, where do we fit into all of this? You know, we're New Testament. This is all Old Testament stuff, but without the Old Testament, there wouldn't be a New Testament. Just put it bluntly. Because out of the Old Testament came Jesus Christ. And out of the Old Testament came salvation. Out of the Old Testament came everything that we have to have to be what we are today. So we want to be that what God has called us to be, which is redeemed. We want to be that salvation that God has offered to the entire world. So if you've never accepted Jesus Christ, if you've never given your life fully to Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, it's not a complicated thing. It is a easy thing. Jesus says his yoke is easy. It's not a heavy burden. It's not a hard thing to carry. It is an easy burden. It amazes me how people struggle with making a decision. But in our world today, our world today wants to make fun of those who want who claim to be a Christian. Don't worry about the world. The world will take care of itself. God <clears throat> is only interested in those who actually see and understand what the truth is. And the truth is that Jesus Christ, Jesus was the sacrifice that paid for your salvation. All you have to do is to take it, is to receive it. And then your position in Christ then becomes your position for the rest of your life and eternity. So that's an important thing. That's the important part of this that everybody needs to understand. So if you've never done that, if you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is the day to do it. This is the time to do it. I want to thank you all for <clears throat> being here. I want to thank you for your attention. And I know the, the, all the scripture about all the, the begites and everything, that's, that's a lot of reading and stuff. But really take it, go back and study it and look at it because it opens up a lot of why, a, a, a lot of understanding on where things come from and why people were who they were and how they got to where they were because of the different things and how close to creation a lot of this stuff actually took place. It's interesting when you look at it. 
I hope you have a wonderful week. Uh, come back and be with us on Wednesday night. And we're starting a study in the book of Revelation and encourage you to be there because it's a, we're going to do a line by line and we're going to, it'll be open discussion. So everybody's welcome to ask questions, make comments, whatever you want to do. And it'll, it'll be worth your while, I think. Um, I'm going to ask Brother Jeff to close us in prayer this morning.